as you can see we're now looking at sub programs also called subroutines so make sure you realize that they're exactly the same thing also some is just called routines all referring to the same thing and they actually we're looking at them from kind of a uh, theoretical perspective they're all implemented in different ways in programs they might be called functions procedures methods and so on so there's a few names we're looking at it from a very generic perspective I tend to call it subroutines but I'm gonna make things difficult by calling them sub programs but it doesn't matter so a sub program or subroutine is an out of line block of code that performs a specific task so by out of line we mean they can well let, let's let's move forward a little bit first before explaining that so they get used and reused throughout the program by calling their name in a statement causing them to be executed so they're declared or sorry, defined, usually at the start of code or in a different class. It's effectively, they're in a unit, they're in a block that's separate to the main program, and they get called by just referring to their name. So that's why they're out of line. They're not, they don't exist where you're using them because you refer to them and it kind of jumps to their execution, uh, execution being to run their code. So data can be passed in to a subroutine through parameters, and parameters are a special type of variable used for the input to a subprogram sub or subroutine. So here's a very, very simple, pretty pointless subprogram to find the mean. So you've got taken the sum and you've taken how many there are in that sum and you just divide them to return the mean. So with 10 and 2, the mean is 5 in that case. And so the parameters are sum and n. These are variables that represent the future input. This is it defining the subprogram. And this could be in a different part of code. This is just in the Python interpreter, so this is a bit artificial. But this is, this is calling it by specifying its name. And then it jumps back to execute whatever's in the subprogram. So parameters are the general name for the variables. Also, sometimes um, the actual data value supplied are called arguments. So parameters are kind of the variable names that are used as templates, whereas arguments are the actual data values passed in. But often parameters is kind of used for both, so bear that in mind. So that's for an input to a subprogram, but for an output is where the return value comes in. There are two types of subprograms that are um, also implementation sometimes. So a procedure is a type of subprogram that doesn't return a value, it just executes some instruction to repeat something, uh, whereas a function does actually have a return value, so it passes out data as well as potentially passing in data as well, or taking data. So subprogram, separate block of code with inputs which are called parameters and outputs which are called return values. You don't have to have outputs or inputs, they can have no inputs and no outputs and just repeat a certain block of code to prevent you from reusing the same code throughout the program. So subprograms can be either user written, user defined or pre-existing and of the pre-existing ones there are two further categories so either built in or library uh, subprograms. So built in are the ones that are kind of fundamental to the basic operation of most programs. So an input function, um, a function returning the length of an array maybe, and like a, a one to open a file, a print function, these are all kind of built into the language that are accessible to you without actually having to do anything other than install your program language. So pre-existing functions usually do a very specific and often difficult purpose. I wouldn't know how to go about coding an input function because it's so technical, you, you really have to know what's going on behind the scenes and I don't know enough of it to be able to do it myself so it's really useful to have these available to you, It'd be very very difficult to program without them. And library functions are similar except they're not there by default. These are pre-written subprograms for very specific purposes that you can include in your program. So this is a bit of C or C++ code for a, so here it is, uh, would be at the top of your file and this is including three different libraries uh, standard uh, input out, standard library and time. So these have very specific purposes and they're not accessible by default. You have to include them or import them to your program before you can actually make use of the functions within them. So here it uh, is, so time comes from the time library as you'd expect and the random generation and the random seed come from standard library and uh, this input output would be for printing out as well. So this is just generating something called a random seed to kind of prep for random generation and then this is uh, generating a random number between 1 and 100. Don't have to know how it works particularly, this is a, a modulus, a modulo operation so this is returning the remainder when this random number is divided by 100 plus 1 and this gives us a random number between 1 and 100. So random generation isn't available by default, it's not a built-in function but you can easily get access to it through a library and there will be libraries for lots of specific things and again things that you wouldn't really be able to code yourself or it saves a lot of time to be able to make use of pre-written sub-programs.
We're now going to talk about local and global variables. So a variable or a constant that are declared inside a subroutine is said to be local to that subroutine. Whereas a global variable is able to be accessed from anywhere. So in this case, we've got a variable 5, which is only declared, or it's not really declared, but it's only initialized inside the, the uh, subroutine example. So B is a local variable. It's only, it's only local to this subroutine. Whereas A is, uh, is, is outside the subroutine. So this at least has a class scope. It can be accessed by the subroutine or any other program, but we are actually giving it um, declaring it to be a global variable here. Not all languages will require you to do this, but essentially at this stage, A is accessible from anywhere in your code, including within the subroutine, whereas B is only local to the subroutine. You can't access it from outside. So here we're adding five to B, so five plus 10. We're, so A is now five at this stage. We print out A and we get five, which is what you'd expect. Um, and when we print B, we still get five uh, here. And this is us calling uh, the subroutine out of, out of line. So when we try and print B on its own, we get an error because B is only accessible through the subroutine. You can't have access to B outside, it doesn't exist outside of the subroutine. So let's break this down a little bit more. You can visualize it like having a global variable, which is in green is our main program and in red is our, local, is our subroutine. And local variable is only accessible within the subroutine, whereas a global variable can be accessed from any other program, including from a subroutine, if that makes sense. So uh, local variables only exist when the subroutine is executing, so they, they might as well not exist as soon as the subroutine uh, returns it, whatever it does. And they're only accessible from within the subroutine, so really important. And it's good practice to not use global variables, actually. You might think, why would you use a local variable? But actually, design-wise, it's really important to minimize use of global variables where you can. So the reason is, or a reason is, local variables take precedence over variables with the same names elsewhere in the code. So if you had a global variable called B and a local variable called B, the local variable takes pre pre uh, takes precedence in that subroutine over the global variable. So if, if they were two separate things, you can essentially have multiple variables with the same name in a program by kind of overwriting what a global variable is. But it's only it's only it's kind of encapsulated within the subroutine. And more importantly, use of local variables prevents issues arising from subroutines accidentally changing and accessing other parts of the program. When you are reliant on global variables, global variables are kind of linking inherently all the subprograms you have in your program because all the subprograms have access to this global variable. So anyone changing the global variable accidentally or um, without the other subroutines knowing essentially uh, it's going to cause an issue. As a local variable is very isolated, you can't cause much damage from within a local variable. And this might not matter so much in a tiny program, but on a very, very large program, this is really important. There's going to be multiple variables with the same name. There are going to be um, risks of affecting data, which you're not meant to change. Structured programming is a topic related to subroutines. And structured programming is kind of a methodology that is meant to improve the quality and clarity of code. So we've talked about the three control structures, there are the three constructs, and they should have a single entry and exit. So there should be no jumps or breaks where possible. You can, you can, I mean, languages do have these constructs still, but they're not advised. It's better to avoid using uh, specific jumps to certain lines or specific break points from loops and so on. A second kind of subset of his methodology is that problems should be decomposed into these modules, these specific self-contained and independent modules. So with global variables, you're not, as I said, they're kind of inherently linking subroutines, so they're not independent in that case. So that's why local variables work, tie into this. And so you implement these little modules as subroutines. We talked about decomposition in that video. And structured programming is sort of implementation of that. And a third point of the structured approach is all about not using global variables again. These independent subroutines should not use a, a global variable to get their data, essentially. Data should be passed in through parameters. And this is, in effect, for subroutines interface. It's a very clear interface. Parameters get passed in. It's a very secure process. It's better to kind of have chains of data getting passed in and passed out through parameters and return statements rather than going through global variables. Other things you talk about if you get asked about structured programming is it's important to use meaningful identifier names to self-document the code. It's very frustrating when someone calls a subroutine a random name or calls it their friend's name or something like that because you have no idea what's going on. It's better to call it calculate balance or set name or something clearly that tells you what it's doing. You want it to be self-documenting. Also, to make code look more structured, you would use indentation. Some languages require indentation as part of a syntax like Haml or 
Python, whereas other languages like Java, the white space doesn't matter so much. But it's good practice to use indentation to show these, mostly to show the subroutines actually. It's very clear what's a subroutine if you have an indentation block showing it as a very distinct unit. So you can use white space to make your code look a lot clearer, a lot more readable. So if you follow these guidelines for the structured approach, what would be the advantage? Well, first of all, code becomes more readable and easier to understand, really important when you work on group projects. The flow, which is sort of a root of execution, is clear. It's clear to see where your code is gonna go. You can trace it yourself. It's clear where the subroutines are. It's easier to test because of this kind of decomposed into modules approach. You can test the individual modules, which is called unit testing. Much easier to test individual parts of your program than test uh, just a mess otherwise. This approach makes it easier for programs to work in parallel as well because they can code separate modules that are very independent, they don't affect each other. So to drive home the point, having a subroutine with clear inputs, clear outputs and no use of global variables means that whatever's happening inside the subroutine doesn't matter because if the input and output is the same, it's if the input and output work, great, but Alternatively, you could have code inside the subroutine which is damaging some other part of the program. So if you don't use global variables at all, that nullifies that effect. And a final point I should have mentioned, probably more, is the main reason for using subroutines. And that is to just reuse code. So much code could get repeated in a program, but just calling the same subroutine every time that has this block of code that's going to get reused is so much more efficient. And also you can use code from other sources like we talked about through libraries.